there. Good morning. Um, welcome uh, to today's um, study. Today we'll be studying um, William Shakespeare's uh, text, A Midsummer Night's Dream. That's a uh, drama. A play written by William Shakespeare. And I know that by now all of you have heard of William Shakespeare. He's a greater writer. He was. He was a greater writer. And you can see uh, what he wrote in the um, 17th century. It is still making waves now. Have lived up to 400, 400 or 500 years after his death. We are still reading his death works to show you the immortality of the arts. Yes. And normally we know that William Shakespeare he is known for um, producing tragedies. Most of his works are mainly tragic eh, works. So when I come across this, as um, it reflects in your scheme of work, I was wondering, you know, ah, William Shakespeare, a midsummer night's uh, dream. So maybe they want to give us something different this time around. Because normally William Shakespeare, you will see his works having a, a being a promise that is having a, a the, the, the title of the book will be a name of a major character in that particular text. And at times it ends up being a tragedy. For instance, you see the Macbeth, um, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and the one we had in the previous set, Othello. All these they were all eh, tragedies. But this one, look at the name. It doesn't even, it's not even eponymous. A midsummer night, sir. Dream. Like normally do it, I'll first of all ask you to look at the text. The name and the picture. What comes to your mind? What do you think is going to be the story inside this? Take a wide guess. <laughs> it's unfortunate we're not in the class, but I would like you to do that. Within a few seconds, you can see a, a couple hugging. And those human beings, they have wings. Imagine, they have wings. And then again, the name, a midsummer night eh, dream. For me, what comes to my mind is that uh, it's like it's going to be something fanciful, something uh, exciting, not something uh, very serious. And you know, when you see uh, creatures with wings, what comes to my mind? Uh, beautiful things like angelic things. So that's the impression I had when I first picked this eh, book. So you draw a conclusion. All right? Then let's start. Um, this book has three acts. Acts one, acts two, three, four, and then five. And it has a, um, various uh, characters that we have here. We have Theseus, the Duke of Athens, Aegeus, father of Hermia, Lysander, who is in love with Hermia, Demetrius, who is in love with Hermia, Philostrates, that is kind of um, an advisor to Theseus, the Duke. We have Queens, the Carpenter, Bottom, Flute, Snog, Snog, Trevelyan, these are the artisans. Then we have Hippolyta, Theseus' uh, husband, the Duke. We have Hemia, the daughter of Aegeus, Aegeus who is, who's a uh, half two lovers, Lysander and Demetrius. We also have Helena, the girlfriend to Hemia. This person, does, nobody loves her. Two guys love one girl. Hemia doesn't have anybody that loves her. Then we have uh, the fairies. We have Oberon, Titania. Oberon is the king of the fairies. Titania is the queen. We have Puck and the other fairies. So these are the characters we have in this uh, text. So what happened in this uh, text? But before I go, I want to call your attention to something important. Why do we read Shakespearean text? In your external exams, towards the end of the uh, OBJs, you will see Shakespearean text there. It's not like it reflects in your theory when they ask you, examine 
the cause of someone's death, what circumstances lead to the quarrel between Okege and the uh, Egeus? No. Why we study this text is for you, it's for, it's for, for you to be able to answer contextual questions. What do I mean by contextual question? A particular place will be lifted from the text, a particular quote. Then the question comes, who said this? To whom? Where was it said? In what events? What are the characters in, around that place? What are their reactions? So these are the type of questions you see in Shakespeare's eh, text. And that's why it is good that you read this text through and through. At times it's difficult to understand. You see what like um, goets, duets. But not to worry. I, I would advise you to pick one of the texts. There is a particular text that has lists of explanation of these there, uh, aka words. At times students find it difficult to understand. Oh, it has long grammar. But not to worry. When you start reading it, it is not most that you understand it line by line. But after reading from a particular place to a particular place, you must have made sense of what that place is telling you or explaining to you. For instance, okay, um, after, after giving us the plot, I will read a particular place. Then you disappear, that is not that difficult to understand. Just pay attention. When you find it difficult, you go to those uh, uh, words to cross check the meaning, and it's going to help you a lot. Alright? So by now we have known who Shakespeare is. He's from the um, United Kingdom, was born on the 26th of April 1564. His father was a healthy trader, the mother from a prosperous family. And this guy, William Shakespeare, he was courageous enough to marry a woman that is 18 years older than he was. That's not his problem. That's what he wants to do. He married her and a heart away. Then again, we also know that he used to he, he wrote a lot of tragedies because he wrote during the time of Elizabethan period. And those days you see uh, things like a uh, love and uh, deaths commonly in the literary works as of that uh, time. So you see Shakespeare's, Shakespearean works filled with their tragedies. So let's see what happens in this particular text. Uh, this particular text. Uh, meets, uh, meets summer night, uh, a midsummer night uh, dream. Let's see if it's tragedy or comedy. All right. So what happens? There is no woman, a girl, an Athenian from Athens. He has a daughter, Hemia. And during that time, the father has a right to choose the, the daughter's uh, suitor, the husband. It's the sole right of the father. So this man chooses, uh, he chooses uh, Demetrius as a nobleman to marry the daughter. But the daughter says, no, I'm in love with someone else. And what the father does, the father now walks up to the duty to lay a complaint. So, when he lets the complaint, the duke, being a fair man, now says, okay, I give you four days, you, um, Hemia. You're supposed to respect your father, but I give you four days to make up your mind. Or else, as their law states, she will be killed or she will be sent into exile. So when she hears this, she now goes to Lysander and tells him, Lysander said, okay, let's elope. I have an auntie in the next uh, city. Let's go there and look where and live her own life. So what happens? Helena, who is Samia's friend, she is the only one who is pregnant to this plan. She's the one that knows. And what did she do? She deliberately leaves the secrets to Demetrius. That's the one that refused to marry her. That's in love with her, Hermia. Why did she do that? Why did she do that? Because she knows that immediately hearing me that Demetrius will want to follow Hermia. And that's exactly what happens. And if Hermia, if Demetrius follows, he, she herself will also follow suit, pursuing her, him. And this is what her, happens. So they all of them now left. In the forest now, Hermia and Lysander, they, when they get to the forest, they started their argument. Please stop following me. You know I don't love you. It is Hermia that I love and I want to marry her. Helena saying, ah, 
but she's in love with someone else. Now, please marry me now. Why don't you want to marry me? You know, at this point now, the king of the fairies, that's um, Oberon, that was his death. And she now feels pity on her. Eh? Helena, look at this young lady. And this guy is not even reciprocating her love. And uh, what a shame. What did he do? He now sends her. Uh, he now sends her. Uh, his uh, favorite, um, favorite uh, fairy. His right hand man, Pork. You know? He now says, Mr. Pork, I want to do something. And he himself, he has the purpose of coming there. Because that wood that they gathered, the fairies normally gather there in the middle of the night. And he himself, Oberon, is having problems with his wife, Titania. Because she has um, his friend's child, a changeling, that she has on time, refusing to give to Oberon. No promise to take that child by all means. He now decides to trick the wife to make him perform shamelessly so that he will collect that child. That's the reason he now comes out there. He now asks the uh, pop to collect a juice. A juice that when it is squeezed on someone's eye, once the person sleeps and wakes up, the first thing the person sees, the person falls in love immediately with that thing. So that's the trick he wants to play on the wife. So when he now sees it to, this, this, this couple currently, he now said, Paul, look at what you're going to do. Go and get this juice and apply it to this young man. I said that when he wakes up, he must fall in love with this young lady. That's what eh, happened. And unfortunately for both of them, they, they leave this place. As they were leaving, Lysander and their Hermiana enters the wood, the two lovers. They now decided to sit, to sleep in the wood because it's now night, so that tomorrow they will continue their journey. So being lovers, they now say, let us give each other space. Let us not consume here. We are not yet married. Let us respect each other. You sleep a few meters away. Thinking that that is the same man that Oberon tells him to apply the juice on. He now applied the juice on Lysander instead of Demetrius. So when Demetrius now wakes up, because they were sleeping a few feet uh, apart, the, the first person he, he encounters is uh, Helena, because Demetrius is now far away from her. He is chasing her away from him. So when he now sees Helena, he, he, uh, Helena, he now uh, falls in love with her. Uh, Helena started pursuing her. When Helena wakes, wakes up, he did not find uh, Lysander. Um, Lysander. He now, she now goes in search of her, Lysinda. So, when uh, Lysinda is professing his love for Helena now, seeing the encounter that this person is not even a principal, so she's supposed to be happy that this person is in love with her. Uh, her. But that's when Obrok now found out that it's a mistake. Now say, look at what you have done. You have applied the liquid on the wrong man, say, I have to ratify this uh, situation. So okay, he's that he's going to do that. Then on the other side of the wood, we now see where the artisans are practicing. You know, they're supposed to present a drama for the king, the Celis and the Hippolyta for their upcoming eh, wedding. So during their practice now, Opera now goes there to distract them. And he now selected one, but Tom, and Tom is said into an ass. And all of the other the, the other people ran away. So, and that ass now goes where Titania is sleeping. And when Titania wakes up, Titania is forced to fall in love with her. They ask her, what's an embarrassment? You know, and that's the, the, the intention of Oberon to make Titania to, to, to behave stupidly. So that when she comes back to her senses, she will now release that small boy to him. And eventually it works for him. So when Hebe now wakes up, start looking for lessons there. Oberon realizes the mistake and asks the um, pop to adjust the mistake that has already been done. So again, as Lysander and Helena we are arguing, they were forced to wake um, Demetrius. They are forced to wake uh, Demetrius. When Demetrius now wakes again, the real person that's supposed to fall in love with him because pop has now added the juice on Demetrius' uh, eyes. What happened? The two men now fall in love with one girl. That is her, uh, Helena. And Helena is confused. So you people now are dancing against me. You know you don't love me. You know you don't love me. And two of you now are in love with me. You want to embarrass me. What kind of thing is this? Uh, please let me, let me be in peace. Unfortunately, 
Hem, uh, Hemelan comes to that place and find out what is happening. Helena, so you can do this to me. You are stealing my mind from me. You know, there is confusion everywhere. Even like saying that I have forgotten about her, eh? his lover, Hemia. That's what the confusion everywhere. So what now happened? The Alexander and the dimensional challenge each other to the duel. They now decide to fight. And whoever wins the battle is going to be uh, Helena's eh, lover. They now leaves. So now Paul have to come and intervene. He deceives both of them. That eventually they run around the boots and get tired. They had to lie down and sleep. What did Paul do? Paul now went and removed that uh, juice on Lysander's eh, hair. And he now applied an antidote that when he wakes up, He's no longer in love with her, Helena. And that's how the Demetrius now fall totally in love with her, Helena. And blessings that also keep on loving her, uh, Helena. So both lovers now come together. When they now wake up, they were met with uh, Egeus' presence. They now see Egeus, Hippolyta, the Thesebs and others. They now enter the bush for their hunting in preparation for their wedding. So the couples now say, ah, what are you doing here? Ah, they now narrated their experiences, thinking that everything happened in a dream. Look at it. Because it's, it's, it's like real, and it's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's happening like in real life, and at the other side of it, it's like in a dream. You know, they, after narrating their encounter, they forgot all their differences. And the king now said, okay, why not have, we will have the three weddings the same day. That's how the three couples now get there, married. Then the last scene, we now see here the artisans. Because after um, Bottom flees from, he, he later on recovers his hair, a uh, 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 pop later turned him back into a human head. When Oberon has achieved his uh, purpose, he now has pity on the wife. The wife regains her senses and says, Ah, what am I doing with this stupid animal? You know, ah, please get away from here. That's when she, she now reconciled with her, uh, Oberon. By then, Oberon has gotten what he, what he wants. And he now gets back to his group and they continue their rehearsal. So the last thing, we now see where they are presenting a drama. This group now is supposed to present a tragic drama where some two lovers kill themselves. But they presented this drama in a way that it was so funny, losing every element of a tragedy in that particular drama. And that's how the drama ends. At last, when the lovers that have wedded, have gone to bed, the fairies now came out, they started celebrating and blessing the new wedded the couple. So that's how this particular drama ends. So you now see, Shakespeare gives, she, he now gives us something different in this particular text. Instead of a tragedy, we now encountered a comedy. It's a humorous eh, text. Alright. So by the time you read this text, I believe you'll be able to answer questions. Please don't say that it's difficult to understand. Just take it one after the other. You read it and reread it. So that if, if any person comes from any particular act one, act two, act three, you will reason. First of all, ask yourself, what is the likely thing that happens here? Is it when they are in the woods? Which are the people that are involved in that particular conversation? What are they arguing about? So you reason before you answer the questions. Like I am going, I'm going to give you this particular question to answer. Then in the subsequent class, we're going to continue. I will give you like two or three questions to answer. What will we do fully? You are meant to read this in the class. I won't be reading only me and understanding only me, no. It's a two-way thing. What will we do? We'll read it. And you get used to the text so that, I can be, so that you can answer questions from this particular text. Okay? So, I'll give you this to answer. You see the questions that comes after this uh, text. This text is extracted from Act 1 to 1. So get your text and look it up. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. And therefore, is wings copied, painted, blind. Nor had lost mind of any judgment test. Wings and, and no eyes, figure on hidden haste. And therefore, is love said to be a child. Because in choice, he is so us, the good. So I'll give you questions from this, okay? Answer these uh, questions. If you read this, you can answer these uh, questions comfortably. All right? See you guys next uh, time. Bye.